This is the Monday, July 4th, 2016 Independence Day episode of The History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new interview every Monday morning, as well as Classical Wisdom Wednesdays and History in Five Fridays. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. And if you're an American here or abroad, Happy Independence Day. This is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Today, our time machine takes us out to the ball game, But not just any ball game. No simple passing of an afternoon in Yankee Stadium or Candlestick Park. Not even on American soil. The place is Chelsea, England. The time, the Great War. That bloody poison shell prelude to the rise of Hitler, Tojo, and Mussolini. The book is titled, Nine Innings for the King, The Day Wartime London Stopped for Baseball, July 4th, 1918. We chatted previously with today's author, Jim Leak, about his Civil War novel for young adults, Matty Boy. Jim is a contributor to the Society for American Baseball Research, Baseball Biography Project. He's also the writer or editor of several books on U.S. and military history and the creative director of Taillight Communications. Jim will be telling us about the Anglo-American Baseball Project. It's an ambitious plan to recreate the Kings game for its centennial, July 4th, 2018. That's two years to the day from when we're uploading this episode, and it seemed like a nice tie-in for Independence Day. You can pitch in to help at aabaseball.org or by following Jim on Twitter at 9 innings 4 King. That's the digits nine and four, nine innings for King. In the aftermath of the Brexit vote, the special relationship between the United States and United Kingdom will have real-world impacts on tens of millions of people around the globe. When negotiating trade deals, say, or just sailing into uncharted waters, it's of tremendous help to have a long history of friendship and trust when you need someone to help. In a small, early way, the King's game officiated by umpire Arlie Latham, started us off then to where we stand now, shoulder to shoulder, in good times and bad. It's a far cry from where we were on July 4th of 1776. Okay, now that we've strapped on our cleats and dulled our spikes just like Ty Cobb would want, yes, he served in World War I, and it's a myth that he's sharpened up those spikes. As we heard when we talked to Charles Learson about his book, Ty Cobb, a terrible beauty. For more on the Georgia Peach and minor leaguers who pitched in on the war effort, let's head back to 1918 and enjoy Nine Innings for the King. I'm joined on the line by Jim Leake, author of Nine Innings for the King, the day wartime London stopped for baseball, July 4th, 1918. Welcome back to the History Author Show, Jim. Thank you. A common knock by people who don't like sports, particularly in baseball, is that it's quote-unquote just a game. As a contributor to Sabre, the Society for American Baseball, I wonder if you'd share not just how you rediscovered the story you describe in Nine Innings for the King, but your feelings about the role it played in the Anglo-American alliance. Well, I discovered it accidentally. The short version is I was at a uh, small antique mall in West Virginia one day and came across a compiled edition of Stars and Stripes, the great army newspaper published in Paris during World War I. This was a terrible, shabby copy. I found a better one, and my wife gave it to me for Christmas. And I had no idea what I was going to do with it, but I found it was so well written. You know, it has a legendary staff. And I was particularly interested... And the sports coverage, it was very good. That led to a blog, which led to my first baseball book, which led eventually to this book about the Kings game in London. 
Those old sports stories are so great. The guys write with such edge and a little bit of sarcasm, a little bit of pizzazz. You're talking about 1918 as recently as about 15 years before the King's game. There were rumblings of war between our nation and the United Kingdom, and people may not realize that. I was in McSorley's old alehouse the night before we were recording this, and there's so much memorabilia on the wall. It's New York City's oldest bar, and they had a framed mat of flags of the nations that had participated in the United States Centennial. And I just hadn't looked at it before, but I noticed in preparation for the Kings game that, of course, the Union Jack wasn't there. That's whatever it is, uh, 30, 40 years before the Kings game, and the things haven't reconciled yet. We fought the War of 1812. That's a long time before, 100 years before. But still, there, there's not this relationship we take for granted today at the time of the Kings game. This is a time when people are still worried about a naval fight between the U.S. and the U.K. They're both sort of struggling to decide who's going to be dominant. Today, we take that special relationship for granted. The Kings game is this spectacle, and it's a way sort of to start us on the path to that place we stand now where we just take it for granted that, you know, you're on vacation somewhere, you meet somebody who's from England, you feel like you have a relationship already with them. So what's the first step here? Whose idea is it to play baseball to bring our nations together? Well, in the book, I liken it to a Rube Goldberg device. that <laughs> all these crazy elements to it. And in some ways, it assembled itself. There was already a baseball league playing in and around London in 1918. The Anglo-American Baseball League with four Canadian teams and four American teams. So naturally, as the 4th of July approached, the American teams began planning uh, a 4th of July game. The information I have is that the Army team, the Army headquarters team, was sitting around their hotel thinking what they should do, and their team captain, Lieutenant Mim, said, hey, we ought to invite the king. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, they just said, sure, that's a great idea. And Mim sort of passed it up the line. Nobody quite knew how to do that. How do you invite a king to the baseball game? So it was like some weeks before anybody managed to get an invitation to the king, to King George V. And it seems to me that King George was waiting for something exactly like this because he had a sort of genius for dealing with the new American allies. He took great interest in what they did and uh, how they trained and wanted them to feel welcome in Great Britain. So King George said, yes, I'll come. And then instantly it became a big deal, it became international news. The king is coming to the ball game, or the baseball match, as the British called it. All these elements added to it, and it just grew and grew and became just an amazing occasion, which is pretty much forgotten today. Yeah, if you didn't find it in that magazine, I mean, how many of us have found a great thing searching through the old newspaper, periodicals, comic books in an antique store? So (laughs) serendipity, here's this Rube Goldberg machine working even into the 21st century in a way by bringing the game back now. Winston Churchill, who attended the Kings game, later said that the U.S. and U.K. are two nations separated by a common language. Baseball has a language all its own. Try talking to somebody in America who's not into baseball about what's going on. It's very hard. So imagine talking to somebody in England who's never seen a game. You recount plenty of funny moments in nine innings for the King, such as when one London writer calls pitching bowling. What are some of the other quirky mistranslations, such as you paint the confusion with a Mutt and Jeff cartoon illustrated that way? What were some of these quirky misunderstandings about the game? Well, the British insisted on calling it the baseball match, and they applied cricket terms to the baseball positions. The confusion also worked the other way. Uh, As you mentioned, the Mutt and Jeff cartoon, they had no idea what the Americans were talking about half the time. One panel from the cartoon has Mutt, who's the tall one. He's in the American Army, and he's trying to explain baseball to a monocled British man at a restaurant. He says, it's like this. The ump yells, play ball. The leadoff man steps to the platter with his mind made up to kill the sphere. The twirler's idea is to make him fan. Maybe he'll use a splitter. (laughs) And then it goes on and on and on. And at the end, 
the poor British man had just slumped back in his chair with his cane on the floor, looking exhausted. <laughs> the fact that all these British subjects do end up coming out and enjoying the game is a testament to how much that they wanted it to succeed and how much they appreciated the American doughboys being over there. In America, people saw major league players as able-bodied men. Many like Babe Ruth wanted to contribute in some way. Ty Cobb, as we talked about in Charles Learson's Ty Cobb, A Terrible Beauty biography, he not only volunteered, he volunteered for the Chemical Warfare Unit, which is as dangerous as it sounds, especially when you have a bunch of soldiers here. They're looking at their baseball heroes trying to tell them how to properly put on a gas mask, which is pretty important. You're probably thinking, how am I going to ask for an autograph? And you forget to put the filter in and you have some major problems there. Never going to have hair on your legs again or something if you don't cover yourself properly. How do the teams in nine innings for the King get their players, managers, and coaches, and what sort of caliber were those men? Well, they were surprisingly good teams, really. I should say that ball players were entering the service in, in fairly large numbers by this time. In fact, there were some very good service teams in the United States, and one of the best was in Boston. Jack Berry, who had been the player manager of the Boston Red Sox, had a great team at the Boston Navy Yard. And the Admiral there was sort of embarrassed by his wealth of talent, and he broke up that team and scattered them through the fleet. And two of them, Mike McNally and Herb Pennock, were sent to Europe. McNally was supposed to serve in Ireland, and Pennock was supposed to go on to the Mediterranean. Well, the admiral in London, Admiral Sims, had a whole different approach to baseball than the admiral in Boston. And he found out these guys were on the way, and there were officers waiting on the dock when their ship landed in <laughs> Queenstown, and they had immediate orders to report to headquarters in London. So they both hurried over to London and found themselves playing baseball for the Navy headquarters team. On the Army side, there was a former major leaguer, a dentist, who was the Army's first plastic and oral surgery outfit, and he was working in a British hospital repairing soldiers' ruined faces. So the Army headquarters team got him. And then there were a number of good collegiate players. There were a number of good minor league players in England. The soldiers in the U.K. at that time were mostly with the Air Service, with now the Air Force. So the word went out, and there were two Air Service teams in the league, but the Army headquarters sort of did the same thing that the Navy headquarters did, and they, <laughs> they went through the aerodromes and siphoned off a lot of good players. The word ringers comes up more than once in, in the coverage of this game. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the quality of, of players in the league was pretty good. In fact, Herb Pinnock on the Navy team is now in the Hall of Fame. Wow. Yeah. You write in Nine Innings for the King, quote, baseball would spread everywhere that the Yanks were during the war. List some of those places and talk about the challenges that the Doughboys faced in finding equipment, for example. If there's no baseball, there's going to be no gloves, bats, and balls. Right. As I said, there were a number of teams around the United States. There was the league in England. There was a huge baseball league in Paris and other leagues scattered throughout France in the AEF. There was a 4th of July game in Rome, an Army-Navy game. There were American soldiers serving with the British in Jerusalem. There was baseball there. After the war, the Yanks played ball in Belgium and Holland and occupied Germany. So really, wherever the soldiers or sailors went, baseball went. As far as how they got the equipment, it's very interesting. I touch on it in this book. Clark Griffith, manager and part owner of the Washington Senators at the time, early in the war started what he called the bat and ball fund. He manages this little fund to buy some equipment for the soldiers he had seen during spring training. Well, the thing just mushroomed and became a major effort throughout the war. They sent baseball equipment throughout the United States and the AEF. And then other organizations, principally the YMCA and the Knights of Columbus, had very strong athletic organizations, and they distributed quite a lot of equipment as well. But even so, uh, that often wasn't enough. So the AEF commissioned French manufacturers to make baseball equipment. The bats were okay. The gloves weren't bad. The balls were absolutely terrible and <laughs> were likely to disintegrate on contact. <laughs> so so if you had a baseball, you really didn't want to lose it. Yeah, I bet. Was that an actual quote at the time, disintegrate on contact? That sounds Yeah, funny. yeah. There was uh, something <laughs> yeah. like, a, it looked like a puff of shrapnel. <laughs> One of the balls, yeah. I guess. <laughs> 
My guest is author Jim Leake, and the book is Nine Innings for the King, the day wartime London stopped for baseball, July 4th, 1918. Visit the Anglo-American Baseball Project at aabaseball.org to pitch in for the recreation of the King's Game Centennial. You can also find Jim on Twitter at 9 innings for king Remember, those are the digits, 9 and 4. L.M. Sutter, author of Artie Latham, a baseball biography of the freshest man on earth, writes of today's book, quote, With a witty, crackling style, Jim Leak tells the story of the most historically dramatic baseball game of all time. And there's plenty of solid research behind his engaging news hound on the scent prose. Nine innings for the king should be on the bookshelf of every baseball fan and anyone interested in the sometimes surprising appearances our national pastime has made on the international stage, unquote. Jim, the word that jumps out from that glowing review is newshound. I love the tone and flash of those old news stories, especially in sports, the way they'd write about it. Sometimes, of course, they'd make stuff up like Al Stump with the infamous Ty Cobb biography. But most of them just wanted to get a good story and beat other guys to it. And especially in the middle of all this carnage in World War I, can you imagine being a sports writer and having the opportunity to send back a story that's about something fun, a game, a positive distraction from all this suffering. So since you started with so little as a journalist, just that one article there in a crumpled up old magazine, what were the early tidbits of information that sort of whet your appetite that set you on this path? And you said, hey, I'm getting excited because there's a real book here. Yeah, it was interesting. The first reference that I found to it, of course, was in Stars and Stripes who mentioned the game. And then there was no game story. (laughs) They they never mentioned it again. So that was kind of perplexing. I finally decided that either the deadline fell exactly at the wrong time or that their correspondent was also working for other newspapers and was paid more for those stories. So the Stars and Stripes never had the story, so I had to track it down elsewhere. So I started looking through both American and British newspapers, and there was a lot of color. There was a lot of description of the city on the day, on the 4th of July, but there wasn't a lot about the game itself. I finally tracked down two actual game stories, neither by a trained sports writer, as it turned out. (laughs) So I pieced those together. I actually assembled a scorebook to track the play through the game. And then, you know, the participants, the players wrote letters back home and that sort of thing. So after really a lot of effort, I had a pretty good handle on the game itself. And then a year later, there was a very good story in, believe it or not, Ladies Home Journal about the game. So that helped a lot of detail and color as well. It was a lot of fun, but it was a long process to assemble the story of the game. Did you find anybody who, not in living memory, but did you find anybody along your travels at researching the book that had some stories to pass on or said, oh, right, that game? Or was it really that completely lost from the historical record? It was almost completely lost. By the 1920s and 30s, what few references there were were garbled and incorrect. But it's interesting. I've made contact with descendants of a few of the players. Those contacts are gradually widening. But the first I made was with the son of the Navy catcher. The Navy catcher was a Harvard-educated Navy flyer named Chaz Fuller. And his son, Blair Fuller, was a writer and editor and one of the founders of the Paris Review. So I connected with Blair via Facebook. (laughs) Of course, that had to be (laughs) Facebook. So we exchanged email for quite a while before Blair's death, and he was very helpful to me. And now I'm in contact with his daughter. And Blair told me that that game was the best day of his father's life, that his father had talked about it, and he remembered discussing it with him. Oddly enough, I'm also in touch with the grandson of the army catcher as well, and he provided a lot of information and sent me scans of his grandfather's scrapbook. So that was very interesting. So I hope when we recreate this game that we can have descendants of the players and participants. I recently was in contact with a descendant of Arlie Latham, so maybe he'll be there at the game as well. That shifts gears from looking into the past to looking into the future, which is not something we usually do with history books, but I guess we do with things like Civil War recreations. This is a reenactment of a baseball game. So 
you talk about the Anglo-American Baseball Project and how you want to bring the Kings game centennial back on July 4th of 2018. That's two years to the day from when we'll upload this episode. What's your vision for that game and how are the plans progressing? Well, our vision is to replay that game in or near London on the 100th anniversary in period uniforms. The plans are progressing slowly. We've made quite a number of contacts. We have our website up and running now. We frankly we don't know yet whether this will be something huge, like the Kings game suddenly became and played in a stadium, or whether it will be on a village cricket green somewhere. I'll be happy either way. We originally had thought to have American service teams playing, but our thinking now is that we'll have one American team and one British team because there's more and more baseball being played in England. And in fact, MLB International is looking to play actual regular season games in England possibly as early as next year. So there are a lot of uh, exciting possibilities, and we're working on quite a number of fronts right now. That was not the case after the Kings game. You write in the book that it was sort of a case of love me, love my dog for the (laughs) British at the time. You know, the Americans were there. They were our allies, and we wanted to show our guests a good time. So we went and watched their game and watched them play, but they weren't ready to play it themselves, especially since at the time you wouldn't have had covered stadiums, and it does rain a lot in the British Isles. So it just didn't catch on then, but... Today, you could have something like an international game. The NFL, the New York football giants are going to play the now Los Angeles Rams again. I've just gotten used to saying St. Louis Rams, and I have to go back to L.A. Rams. I'm planning on going to that game myself, and then hopefully in two years back for the Kings game. Wherever you end up having it, it'll be great, whether it's a bleachers or in a big stadium. As for the war itself, again, baseball is a game, but not just a game. The skills you learn apply in other areas of life and even in war and death. One thing I've always heard and that you mentioned in Nine Innings for the King is how the Yanks threw their grenades. If you look at the American grenades, it's a pineapple, they call it, right? It's a ball as opposed to the German one, which is a stick with the exploding part on the end. Talk about the influence that baseball, that American doughboys growing up playing baseball, pitching, hitting, catching, played in trench warfare. Right. The Yanks really were famous as great grenade throwers or bomb throwers. And there were a number of these devices. Last year, I was at the National World War I Museum in Kansas City, and there was a whole display of all these different kinds of grenades and bombs. But most of them are roughly the size and shape of a baseball. If you've seen the Army training films, you're supposed to throw it in sort of a lobbing motion. But a lot of the Yanks, you know, they grew up playing baseball, and they threw it like baseballs, and they threw it far, and they threw it accurately. And believe it or not, there were actual competitions for how far can you throw a grenade. And, of course, it was always the Yanks (laughs) who won these competitions and threw them amazing distances and accurately. There's a funny description in the book from, I think, a YMCA worker who was going on a road near the front distributing oranges. And the worker was tossing the oranges out to the Allied troops. And the French and the English, they'd sort of bobble it, you know. And the the Yanks, (laughs) they'd throw them oranges, and they'd catch one, stick it in a pocket, you know, catch another one, hand it off to a French kid. (laughs) And, And, you know, it was like they were playing ball all the time. And it made a difference to them as soldiers, I think. And if people are listening in America or the United Kingdom and they want to keep up to breast on the Kings game replay, or they just want to spread the word about it because it is fascinating. I can see people already getting worked up about it on social media at your Twitter account. How can they help and where can they find more information on the Kings game replay? Well, they can find more information on our website, aabaseball.org, or our Twitter or Facebook account. And our website has a contact page, uh, please. We'd love to hear from anybody who's interested in the game or wants to help. And at this point, we're also searching for corporate sponsorship and support. So if there are any captains of industry or business out there who would like to help, we'd love to hear from them. Yeah, I think if people just sit down and think sometimes, you may not realize who you know, or you may pick up nine innings for the king and you start looking through and you say, hey, that's a familiar name. You may not realize who you have in your family tree. My wife does genealogy, as I've mentioned, and that's at our website, historyauthor.com. And people will contact her and say, oh, I, I don't know anything. I thought that myself because so many of the records were destroyed by the Turks when they came and 
killed my grandmother's whole family. They burned everything. Then they invaded Cyprus. There go all the records for my other pair of grandparents. But there are things you can find if you have somebody who's a trained genealogist. You may have one of these players in your family tree and you have no idea about it. This was wartime after all. Then the Spanish influenza epidemic. People died and then wives back home got remarried. So it's worth looking into your family tree and you're finding descendants already. How are you finding people? If somebody wants to contact you, they do it through your website. But how have you already made contact with so many people that are descendants? Well, you know, primarily they come to me. They see the book or a reference somewhere and they get in contact. Originally, of course, it went the other way when I contacted Blair Fuller and, and the word just sort of gets around. There were a lot of interesting ball players and, and kids on that team, and most of them nobody has ever heard of, but there were some interesting stories. I'd love to hear from their families. For instance, there was a Navy shipwright named Theodore Fieros from Phoenix, and he was a full-blood Native American. He grew up educated at the Indian school out there in Phoenix. So I'd love to know more about his story. There was a kid from Toledo who played semi-pro ball in the Toledo teams, and worked for one of the Toledo newspapers. So for a little while, you know, he was a real hero in his hometown. The Army captain, Floyd Mims, was a very colorful character. I'd love to hear from someone in his family. At one point, I don't know, 40 years ago, he left his papers to a small library in Georgia, and they disappeared, unfortunately. I'd love to find those papers and read what he had to say about that game. So... There are so many good stories from the Kings game. The Navy second baseman was a, a young diplomat named uh, Stuart Hayes, who had played in the Blue Ridge League earlier. So and they called him Skeets, Skeets Hayes. Skeets had played for the Army team as a civilian, and when the Navy questioned that, he was ruled ineligible, and then the Navy gave him a commission, so he started playing for the Navy team. <laughs> so there are all kinds of good stories. So I'd love to learn more about all of them. There was only one person I couldn't track down of, of the starting lineups. That was someone named either Van Natter or Van Hatta. I've seen a half a dozen spellings for his name. He was a yeoman on the Navy team, and some of the accounts said he had played in the Western League, though I've never found any reference to a, a ball player with any of those spellings in, in the Western League or elsewhere. So that's the one real remaining mystery. Paint us a picture of this game when it finally comes together. Just take us to a few minutes in the stands, maybe your favorite few minutes of the game, when you're watching with a bunch of fans that have never seen a baseball game before, and dignitaries such as Winston Churchill, the young, I guess, colonel at the time during the Great War, but also the king himself, the king of England is there. So paint a little picture of what happens there at the game and why it was so fascinating to you and now to so many readers. Well, you know, the 4th of July actually was a holiday in London that day, 142 years after the Declaration of Independence. American flags were flying atop British buildings with the Union Jack, and there was an immense crowd at the stadium. The published estimates of the crowd range, that's great, it ranges from 18,000 to 70,000. <laughs> the official figure was 34,000, but that may have only been the paid attendance because troops got in fray. Mike McNally, who had played in the World Series for the Red Sox, he estimated 50,000, and I think that's probably a good estimate. So it was about half Londoners, half American and British troops, and the Londoners really weren't prepared for, for the Americans. They were astonished by their enthusiasm, their apparent good health, by their, uh, their athleticism. But most of all, they were amazed by the noise, the simple amount of noise they raised in this <laughs> stadium. The king and the royal family and the VIPs were in the middle of the grandstand. Dope boys were on one side, American sailors were on the other, and they were yelling and cheering at each other back over the heads of the king <laughs> and, and the royal family. And by all accounts, the, the king just loved it. He was, he was laughing, and he would stand up occasionally to acknowledge some cheer or something. And many of the Yanks who attended the game had to explain the game to Britishers. That's what the Yanks called them, Britishers. So you can imagine most of these Londoners had never seen baseball before. So here are these poor Yank officers or civilians trying to explain a foul ball or a bunt or, or anything. 
you know, there was just raucous. There were cheers going back and forth. And at one point, there was a cry of "Kill the umpire," which alarmed some of the Britishers. <laughs> <laughs> so the Americans had to, you know, quickly assure that was a time-honored call, and it didn't mean anything <laughs> physical. So it, it was quite amazing, and, and it was a, a very good game. And at this point, the war was still somewhat in doubt. The Germans had made a very dangerous push in the spring, which American troops had helped stop. But the American First Army wasn't in the field yet. And to some extent, the British were simply unsure about us. So this game really helped to reassure them that we were there, we were strong, we were energetic, we were capable. The Times of London said the game took them back to peaceful times of blue skies when they didn't have to worry about being bombed by Zeppelins or bombers or, or whatever. It really made a difference. And there was a British Army colonel who said, well, I can see we're going to win this war now. And I think that's one of the failures that came out of the game. It really did make a difference to British morale, and I think they trusted us more after that game. It's something you learn about history by reading about a game, because Americans were doubted they were going to break up all of Pershing's troops. They thought, well, these guys don't really know how to fight a European war. We'll just plug them in there. These are men that were drafted. These were not trained standing army soldiers. The U.S. didn't have one at the time. So this helps to bring all that to the fore, helps them to make their bones. As you were describing the game there and the clash of cultures in the stands, it reminded me of a place people can go to maybe see a video that's a little bit like that. And that is if you go watch the games between the Soviet Union and Canada in the Soviet Union at the time, they had that goodwill match, four games in Canada, four games over in the USSR. Of course, in this case, the Russians very much knew hockey, but they didn't watch it the way the Canadians watch it. They didn't go get a whole bunch of beer and start screaming. <laughs> they have a trumpet at one point and they start passing it around. The Soviet authorities are trying to find who has this trumpet that they're blowing and making all this noise. And the Canadian fans are sort of passing it around from one to the next secretly, and then it'll blow in a different point. And I guess all the KGB are policemen will run over there for it and they start chanting famously da da canada nyet nyet soviet and the russians then like yeah so a little bit i guess like rocky when he fights and uh, against all suspension of disbelief the soviet crowd starts chanting for rocky right against drago i guess because the gorbachev lookalike starts applauding but that's what the king's game in my head looks like here are these fans that are so outwardly enthusiastic and all these people who are used to very seriously watching maybe a cricket match. And the important part being that it brings people together, brings countries together. Sports has a way of doing that. So right. for the final time, I'll say it's not just a game. It's something that is very human about us. And the centennial of independence, the British were not represented. But here we go to 1918 and they're flying American flags off of buildings. And it's just an incredible transformation that this game helped to bring about. To wrap up the ninth inning of our chat, I want to give you a final chance to make your pitch to listeners. I just gave my best pitch there, but I probably a little bit to the side of the plate, maybe there. A little hook. So I'll trust you since you're the one that wrote the book to really drive this one home. Why is the Kings game important for us not only to read about here in 2016 and maybe to go to, but to recreate it on its 100th anniversary? Well, it really was a pivotal event, I think. There was a scene after the game was over. Navy won the game and a really wonderful, exciting game. The sailors and this crowd and the soldiers all poured onto the pitch. They were playing on a football pitch. And the sailors were snake dancing through the crowd, you know, just amid general hilarity. It was just bedlam. And then one of the British bands struck up the Star Spangled Banner. Everything stopped immediately, immediately. All the troops snapped to his attention. The Londoners all stopped. Everything was silent as they played what would later become our national anthem. And to many observers, that was the moment when a special relationship was born. That was what everybody remembered, that sudden silence and reverence amid the bedlam. So it was a great game, but it was an even greater event. So that's what we want to celebrate exactly 100 years later. Jim Leake, author of Nine Innings for the King, 
Thank you for sharing that moment with us. Also worth remembering that our national anthem is a song born out of the War of 1812. So there's an even more amazing historical moment when you think about this is British and Americans fighting at war tooth and nail. We talked to the authors of The Man Who Captured Washington and about how he really, despite burning the Capitol, treated everybody with respect, burned only a couple of buildings there, burned the White House infamously. But this was sort of always this idea of here was this family squabble, here we split, and yet always looking for ways to reconcile with the mother country. So I really appreciate you joining me today and uncovering a great story of baseball. I am a person who's in love with history, right? So when I think of you maybe not picking up that old tattered issue of Stars and Stripes, I get a little scared because I think uh, I, I know that I would have a much, much less rich appreciation for World War I and our experience over there than I do after nine innings for the King. This shaped our world for the better. I hope you will check in with us from time to time as the July 4th, 2018 replay takes shape. And I look forward to seeing you in the dugout for the big game. Thank you. I hope to see you over there. Again, the book is Nine Innings for the King. The day wartime London stopped for baseball. July 4th, 1918. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there, or even bookmark the URL off our homepage for all your online purchases. You go to historyauthor.com, click that Amazon link, and when you make a purchase, we get a small percentage of everything you buy at no additional cost to you. Once again, thank you to Jim Leak for joining us and for sharing this forgotten story of the international baseball game that helped forge the special relationship. For more on the centennial recreation of the Kings game on July 4th, 2018, visit the Anglo-American Baseball Project at aabaseball.org. You can also follow Nine Innings for King on Twitter. And remember, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. Well, that's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for Classical Wisdom Wednesday, History in Five Friday, and next Monday's all-new interview. And if you subscribe to us on iTunes, please take a minute to leave us a review. Until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today. And have a great week. Katie, Katie was baseball mad, had the fever and had it bad. Just to root for the hometown through every zoo, Katie Blue. On the Saturday, her young beau called to see if she'd like to go to see a show. But Miss Kate said, no, I'll tell you what you can do. Katie, Katie saw all the games, knew the players by their first names, told the umpire he was wrong all along, good and strong. When the score was just two to two, Katie, Katie knew what to do, just to cheer up the boys she knew, she made the gang sing this song. Take me out to the ball game, take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and crackerjack. I don't care if 